Can one turntable really sound better than another? This is what I would like to talk to you about today. Welcome back to my vinyl TV channel. My name's Craig, and I was reading some comments um, on one of the last videos that I posted, um, and something kind of struck me. Uh, I was a bit inspired to do a bit of a, a vlog on some topics here that I've been mulling over for quite a while. One of the things that um, I've heard a lot on my travels in my vinyl um, endeavors, in my vinyl hobby, uh, is how one turntable can sound better than another. And, I mean, I'm 52 years old. I used to listen to records when I was a teenager. That was my main format of listening, and we didn't have the internet back then, so we had to do things by the seat of our pants. And I don't think the records sounded as good back then as they're sounding today. And I've got my Audio-Technica turntable sitting in front of me because I want to demonstrate a couple of things. You know, the question of whether one turntable can sound better than another is, dep it depends on some things. And, you know, I really want to get down to earth about this with you guys, okay? Please bear with me. Let's get realistic. Let's forget about what all of the audiophile guys are telling us. Let's, let's reset ourselves for just a moment and, and really be realistic about some things, okay? Um, because there's a lot of jargon out there. There's a lot of snake oil out there, if you will. And, you know, at this point in time, there are companies out there that are really capitalizing on this resurgence of vinyl. And they're diving into it. They're going, wow, people are buying turntables. Let's get in on the action. And I don't necessarily think that some of the more popular turntables out there are as good as people think they are. But, um, you know, that's why I went with the one I went with, the, the Fluence turntable. And I'm not saying that it's, you know, a fantastic model either. I do love the thing and I love the sound of it. And I can tell you the things that I like about it. I've already told you in other videos. It's quiet. It's reliable it's the speed is good it tr it does what it's supposed to do and it does it well without adding any sound coloration at all to my ears really what we're talking about when we're talking about sound quality or sound coloration is what is the device the the deck let's just say doing the you know the, what is the playback device doing to the sound and where are the opportunities for it to change the sound before it leaves the unit and goes, goes into your amplifier. Now let's use a cassette deck as an example. I have two of them here. I have a TIAC and I have a Sony. Now, they both sound different. They actually sound much different than each other. Um, I can tell you that the TIAC actually sounds better than the Sony in some ways, but the Sony has its own characteristics that I like better than the TIAC. Now what makes them sound different? Well, a cassette deck is, is a mixture of mechanical and electronic components. So the mechanical part is that, you know, somehow we have to move the tape along the playback head and the record heads so that we can record and playback signal. So that's done by what's called a transport mechanism, and it's quite complicated in a cassette deck. Um, there's lots of cogs and wheels and belts and things and, you know, uh, stuff that goes on. And if that's done properly, without any kind of interference to the um, uh, to what's trying to be accomplished, which is to reliably and steadily pass the tape, uh, pass the heads at a proper speed without interfering. That's what the transport mechanism needs to do. And from then on, it's the electronics job to uh, handle what's going on. So you've got your playback record head, which is an electromagnet, basically. And you've got, um, you know, that is a thing in itself, which is like a phono cartridge, really. Um, then you've got all of the electronics inside the cassette deck. And if you've ever taken one apart, you would know that the thing is full of components. You know, you've got amplifiers, you've got Dolby circuits, you've got equalization circuitry, um, biasing. And, you know, there's so much that goes into it. I'm going to do a video on this, by the way why cassettes sound so good because they do they can and but there's so so there's so much going on inside these units and every one of them is different every model is going to sound different because there's so much stuff going on inside there that can change the sound 
um, even two exact same models of the same cassette deck can sound different from each other for various reasons. So in comparison, let's look at a turntable and find out what it is that can color the sound. Now, for one thing, what you have to realize is that there's almost no electronics inside of a turntable. Some turntables have a built-in preamplifier, and so that in itself can change the sound. Well, any, any preamplifier is going to have its own personality, and, you know, it's going to handle the sound differently. My preamplifier, Phono Stage, uh, there's a seems to be a bit of a, mi a mix mismatch of terminology here. I think uh, the I think the terms can be interchangeable in some cases. Since we are talking about turntables, I think the term preamplifier is appropriate, especially when you go and look online to buy one. They're called preamplifiers. These little boxes that you plug your turntable in so you can get it to work on your amplifier. Anyway, all preamplifiers are going to sound different, and that's really where the coloration basically begins. Before the preamp, all we really have is a mechanical thing that turns at a certain speed, hopefully the right speed, reliably, quietly, and steadily. And that's all it has to do. If those three things are in place, then you have a non-obtrusive motor system in your turntable that's not going to change the sound whatsoever. There are people out there who buy, uh, let's say, uh, one of those U-turn turntables, or I think the other one's a pro project, 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 um, and there's other models out there that are popular. And these, some people are up, deciding to upgrade the belt. Okay, so I don't know where my phone is at the moment, but if I take my phone and I put it on here, and I set that app up, it measures the speed, and I turn this on, I don't know if it's going to be the exact 33 and a third RPM, okay? But it doesn't matter, as long as it's close to that, and it's steady. So as it goes around, if that number stays basically the same, 33.3, 33.4, you know, somewhere in that vicinity, you know that your turntable is running at the exact speed, it's running at a constant speed, Okay, and if you press the button and you listen and you don't hear anything, then it's also running quietly. That's all it has to do. So why people are spending thousands and thousands of dollars on turntables with separate motors and all this motors that are two feet away from the turntable? I mean, it's just it gets to the point where there's a you know it's, it's a diminishing returns. You know, this turntable isn't necessarily the best for having a quiet motor in it but that one my fluence is and i can play the quietest record i have and i cannot hear that damn motor so for me i don't need to upgrade anything as far as that goes now for the belt people are spending 50 dollars on these you know special belts for their turntables um they're made of some special material and this is supposed to stabilize the sound or something or make it run at a better speed. Well, if the turntable is already running at a reliable speed, at a constant speed, according to, you know, you put a strobe disc on it or you put a record on it with a tone and you have an oscilloscope and you measure or you use your phone app, or whatever it is you need to do. If that turntable is running at a proper, reliable, steady speed, you don't have to worry about replacing the belt. The belt that has it in there is fine. So please try to be realistic about this. Think about what a belt will do for a turntable, what a different belt will do. Think about the physics behind that and try to be realistic about it. What is that, what difference is that gonna make? There was a guy on YouTube, he said he, he, pra he this is true, okay, I saw this. He replaced the belt on his project turntable and all of a sudden his turntable had more bass okay so that's where it gets really crazy there's no there's absolutely no correlation between the fidelity of the sound coming out of the turntable and the belt that's driving the platter 
the only thing the belt is going to do is affect the speed. That's it. So um, that is just that is the kind of thing that people are thinking. It's because there's so much. I call it audio foolery. Um, audio. The term audiophile is so somebody who's very so much into the audio field that they are just crazy about it, which is fine. You know, they're fanatical about it, and everything has to be. They spend a lot of money on wire and everything. And that's an audio file, and I don't like the term audio fool. But those people are out there too. People who just, oh, you know, if I put my um, amplifier on a better stand, it's going to sound better. And that's true. That's not true. It's true that people think that there are people out there selling stereo racks you know, component racks, stands, okay, that tell you that if you put your your stereo components, and I'm not talking about your turntable, I'm talking about your amplifiers and your DACs and everything, you put those on a different, better shelf, that your stereo is going to sound better. What, are the components happier on that new shelf? I mean, really, scientifically speaking, what is the uh, mechanical mechanism what is the scientific mechanism by which a shelf can improve the sound of electronic components come on guys really we got to get back down to earth here that's like saying if you shave in the downstairs bathroom you're going to get a closer shave than if you shave in the upstairs bathroom it's just it's nonsense i don't care what anybody says someone needs to explain to me how that can affect the sound quality and I'm, again, no mechanical devices. We're just talking about this stuff. So this shelf needs to go. I need to get one of those new shelves, and it's going to make my stuff sound so much better. Okay. I digress. Let's move on. Okay. Okay, so now, next thing is the bearing. Let me take this off here. The bearing is the thing in the middle that the platter sits on and spins on. Okay. Now, I, I, you can. This, this turntable is a direct drive, so you can. So the, the bearing is inside the motor, um, and of course the motor has resistance because it has magnets and it has coils, and so there's going to be some magnetic resistance, you know, EMF, uh, electromagnetic force or whatever reverse. I'm not an electrician, but there's going to be some resistance there because of that, and also the bearing itself is going to have some resistance. But and I mean, I'm spinning this thing, and it is smooth smooth as a baby's bottom okay so you know when i put this on i never get this on the first time oh look i'm lucky you know i spin that around to me that doesn't look like something that's going to be obtrusive to the spinning of your vinyl record and once you turn this thing on and it's not plugged in but um it's going to go around and that, that bearing is going to do what it's supposed to do which is allow this thing to go around and if the motor is strong enough even a bearing that's slightly unlubricated should not, still should not affect the speed of the turntable. So why are people going out and spending extra hundreds of dollars on a new sub platter and a new bearing for their turntable that's made of titanium coated in brass with a special shaped this and it's got, I mean, all these features, it's a bearing. All it has to do is that. I mean, you know, what difference is that going to make? in the sound quality of your turntable. So, oh, I put this new bearing on my turntable, and wow, it just opened it right up. Oh, gosh. Okay, okay, so, now, what is it about the turntable platter itself, and this whole mechanism, this part of it, not this part, but this part, that can affect the sound quality? Well, we have the motor, we talked about the motor, it's quiet, okay, the motor's quiet, everything's good, quiet motor, loving it. Okay, the bearing is nice and smooth. It's not going to change the speed of the turntable. There's no noise. It's allowing the thing to spin nicely. Check. Okay, there's two check marks right there. Right. Number three, the motor's not going to make a hum or anything like that. Same as it being quiet. I guess it falls into the same category. So there you have it. The thing's turning at a constant speed at 33 and third, and it's quiet. That's all it's got to do. <laughs> You've got it made. There you go. Congratulations. Now. In regards to speed, since we're on the topic of that, a lot of people are going to, you're going to see people, you're going to see people say, oh, well, my turntable is running at 33 and a half RPM instead of 33 and a third. Okay. 
Oh, I, you've got to get under there and adjust the damn things. You know, you've got to get, got to get it back to normal again. Let's look at that first. Let's take this off. Let, actually, I'll flip it over so that we can see the, the markings on here. I'll use these markings as a, a guide. So this is pointing upwards. Okay. So an RPM is a revolution per minute. That's how many times this is going to go around in one minute. So 33 and a third RPM. And I know this is elemental stuff, but just bear with me. Bear with me. Bear with me. Um, 33 RPM means that in one minute, this turntable is going to rotate 33 and a third times. Okay? So at the end of a minute, it's going to come back to here. And then at the extra third of a revolution, it's going to be pointing down to here. So in one, so in 33 and a third revolutions, in one minute, you turn off the power, it's going to sit right here. That's one third of a revolution more than 33. Point zero. Okay? Let's suppose your turntable is running at 33 and a half RPM instead of 33 and a third. Okay. That means that the platter is going to rotate 33 times in one minute. And at the end of that minute, it's going to stop and it's going to end up here, down, pointing toward the bottom. So 33 and a half of a revolution. Let's look at the difference between 33 and a third and 33 and a half. So there's 33 and a half, and here is 33 and a third. So in one minute, that platter was off by like that much. It took one minute for the, turn, the, the rotation of the platter to be that much further ahead of itself than it would have been if it was at 33 and a third. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is not a lot of difference, folks. It is negligible. It is silly to even worry about it. Even if it was traveling at 34 revolutions per minute. Well, that's one whole, revo that's, that's one whole revolution in one minute that it was off i mean okay fine maybe there you could start to feel a little ocd about it and go okay it's 34 i gotta get under there and adjust the speed but you know you're talking 33.2 33.3 33.4 stuff in there it as long as it stays at that speed and doesn't waver up and down you're fine that's nothing that much of a rotation in one minute is nothing yeah, I, I don't even think CD players are always that accurate. They don't always, they're not always bang on. It depends on the clock speed inside the CD player. So, you know, try not to be too obsessed with, you know, whether your turntable is running at exactly 33 and a third RPM. I think the best thing for you to do is get one of those um, strobe uh, things where you put it on and you put a, a fluorescent or a neon light up to it and you watch the lines. Like this thing has it on the edge here. If those little dots are moving, yeah, you're off by quite a bit. Because in one minute, that might go all the way around a couple times. But if it's just, like, dead on, and it's losing a third of a revolution per minute, okay, I've, I've gone on long enough about that. Now, here's another one. A lot of people are taking these, these, these platters off. This is, okay, you know, here, let's talk about the platter. How can the platter influence the sound of the turntable? Okay, so you've got a platter, you've got a mat... And you put your record on there. Now, you put your stylus on the record and you play the record. So what's happening? The grooves of the record are going to cause the stylus to vibrate. Now, these vibrations are so small that even you, when you watch the thing, you can't see that style. I mean, maybe if you can see it back, going back and forth, you've got good eyesight. Very good eyesight. The vibrations are very, very small. So there's two things about that one of them is that they're so small that we have to amplify them so much so any little sounds or uh things or interferences that are getting in there are also going to be amplified so we do have to be mindful and careful about you know any interferences that might be going on with the turntable and that is absolutely very important you know um but the vibrations are they're also so small that they're not causing a lot of vibrations elsewhere in the turntable. So do you really think that the platter 
is going to make a difference in the sound quality, whether it's acrylic or metal or, or you know, whatever, glass, whatever, okay? Uh, as far as the flywheel effect, yes, the heavier the platter, the more stable the sound, the more uh, beefy a motor you have to have, and, but you're going to have a, a nice, more smooth rotation, theoretically, and um, you know, that's absolutely true. <clears throat> but as far as the sound quality, well, I've heard people go, well, listen to this. You know, you take the platter off, you know, going to listen, listen, right? And they're going, listen to that. This thing rings like a bell. That's terrible. That's going to affect the sound of my record. Do you really think that the stylus is vibrating that much that it's going to make it through the record, through the mat, into the platter and cause the platter to ring like that? That's a que I'm, it's a rhetorical question. I'm not going to answer that for you. That's up to you. Is it really is there that much vibration going on in that stylus that it's going to make this thing ring? That's what I want to know. The, ne the next thing is, well, we're putting a mat on it. The mat's going to dampen the ring a little bit. A little bit. Okay. Well, that helps a little. That's a felt mat. Let's try a uh, rubber mat. Okay. It doesn't matter if it's straight. Oh, well, pfft. there you go. Problem solved. No more. There's no more ring in this platter. Okay. And then you're going to put a record on it. Don't worry. This record's not a good one, so it doesn't care if I touch it. Then you're going to put that on. It's even more dead. So don't obsess over that ringing of the platter. It's like, again, people are not thinking this through. We need to be realistic about this, okay? Um, now, the, let's move on to the mat. This video is probably going to be long. The mat. This is a felt mat. People go, oh, you should replace that mat. You should get a lot, much better sound if you replace the mat. Well, again, the stylus is vibrating in the grooves. That's causing resonances and vibrations in the vinyl. I mean, it is. Whether they're minute or not, doesn't matter. They're still there. And that record theoretically is going to vibrate along with the stylus and so what's underneath the record could very well affect um, how those vibrations um, occur how strong they are how much they are dampened excuse me and of course the concern is that their vibrations are going to make it back up into the cartridge and you're going to hear them as resonances and it's going to affect the sound quality so um so the mat, um, I think for me, the most concern about the mat is static. Okay. When I pull a record off this felt mat, it's practically mat sometimes sticks to the bottom of the record. That's how much static there is. Whereas a cork mat, let's say is not going to, that's not going to happen as much. So we're eliminating static, which is bad because it causes the attraction of dust. And it can also affect the sound quality of the cartridge, believe it or not. You know, it's being pulled down towards the vinyl because of, of the static electricity. So we don't want that, right? So that's a good point. But if I put a cork mat on this turntable instead of this felt one, am I really going to notice the difference? And if so, why? What is going on there that is going to... What is the mechanical means that is going to allow it to sound better if I put a, a different mat underneath this record? It, theoretically, it will stop the record from vibrating as much due to the stylus, and therefore you'll have less feedback or less resonance um, coming back into the sound of the cartridge. Th these vibrations are so small that I can't believe that you would hear them alongside of the music that you're already listening to, which is actually quite loud. However, we are amplifying this thing a thousand or more times. So any little things that go on here are also going to be amplified. So I don't want to dismiss. I just want to cause everybody to think a little bit. Don't just believe it. Oh, I got to put a better mat. Oh, I got to replace the belt. Oh, I got to get... No, think about, think about it first. How can that influence the sound? Okay, let's move on to the, um, the tone arm. Okay. I know that it's possible to spend a lot of money on a tone arm. Um, 
you know, most high, very high end turntables have a separate, a removable tone arm. You can put whatever tone arm on you want. The tone arm, of course, is this, this thing here, right? So I know of a guy who paid, who's got a $35,000 turn tone arm, $35,000. Let's get that $35,000 for this thing, this thing. And he says it makes a difference. Well, for $35,000, it bloody well better. This is the kind of thing that really discourages us guys who don't have that kind of money to spend on stuff like that. And I'm really speaking to you guys out there who really can only afford what most of us can which is, a, you know, a fairly basic, modest turntable. You know, we try to spend as much money as we can and we want to be proud of our purchases. But, and you know, when we start, when you look at these these trade shows and things like that, and, and you've got this turntable that's almost the size of a refrigerator. The thing's worth $250,000. Okay, it, it's, it's, you know, it's made of titanium. I don't know, it, it's got, you know, pneumatic suspension everywhere it's floating on air it's got magnetic you know i mean it's just to play a record well all all we're doing is playing a record do we really need a fifth you know a two hundred fifty thousand dollar record player people are buying them i i can't watch those videos for very long i just it makes me it just makes it frustrates me what the, the mistake I think that a lot of audiophile people make is that they don't come down to our level and say, hey, you know, you don't need to buy something like that. Go ahead and get yourself a, a project or a fluence or a, or a techniques or whatever, an audio technica, whatever, you know, or dual, whatever all the other brands are out there. So, you know, I mean, it's fine. Um, but a lot of this, there's a lot of snobbery out there. And, it, and you know what? I, I'm a home brewer. I make my own beer. And... In that community, there also can be some problems with that kind of thing, you know, and I know that for a fact because I've been making beer videos for almost 10 years now. And um, my channel is called Craig Tube, if you want to check that out and make your own beer. But, you know, I know firsthand, I don't have the most expensive setup. I don't have the most expensive equipment. I do use little simpler methods to make my beer. And that's just it. That's the, that's the level of beer making that I've decided to go for. So there are people that look down their nose at me and go, oh, well, look at him. He's telling everybody they don't need expensive equipment. They don't need big pots. They don't need to use this ingredients, you know, and, and it, but, you know, the thing is not everybody has the space, the time or the, you know, the wherewithal to, to brew beer in such a way that it's just, it takes an entire day to do so. Um, and it's just, you know, I've always said to those people, it's it's whatever works for you. And if you enjoy the beer that you make, who cares what how you made it? So in, in this situation, if you enjoy the sound of your equipment, who cares what it is? If you like the sound, that's all that matters. A lot of fuss is made about these tone arms and $35,000 for a tone arm. I'm sorry, I don't understand. All it has to do is hold a cartridge with a stylus. And let's not belittle the fact that this is a very delicate operation that's going up. There's a stylus garden here, don't worry. There's a very delicate operation going on here. It's very fragile. It's very precise. It's probably one of the most, you know, I mean, it's probably one of the most precise instruments in your home, to be quite honest. And it's, it's operating at such minute voltages that, yes, it's very important to have the best mechanical situation that you can without going overboard. Because there's a point at which there is really, I believe, no benefit to spending any more than a certain amount of money. This thing has to move back and forth, which this does. Okay, so check, right? Now, if I lower the tone arm, I take off the cartridge. It swings back and forth. You can see that uh, aside from the fact that the anti-skating control is affecting it, that's pretty smooth. I mean, I don't see any, I don't see how that 
movement could cause any problem at all while the record is playing. All it has to do is move slowly from the edge of the record into the center. So we're talking about the bearing here. The bearing is where the sig pivots. Okay? People are fussing about these damn bearings. If this turns and sm smoothly and if this moves around smoothly like it's supposed to, you're good. How is this movement going to affect the sound of your, your music? And I'm actually asking that question. You know, is the bearing going to make a sound? I don't hear anything. I don't feel anything. That seems pretty smooth to me. And this is not an expensive turntable. So, you know, all these fuss about bearings and things. I just, yes, this is a rant. I'm sorry. You know, I don't want to, I don't want people to be scared. Well, I can only afford a $300 turntable. So woes me. No, don't woes you. That's an awesome turntable. I only paid $250 for mine here. I love the thing. It's quiet. It's the right speed. It doesn't have any wow and flutter. It's, it tracks the records beautifully. It sounds awesome. It's all I need. Okay, the other thing that can play into the sound quality, apparently, theoretically, of your records is the fact that, and we talked about tone arms, and the fact that I, I, I can't, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me why anyone would spend that much money on a tone arm. But, anyway, the tone arm itself also can vibrate due to the stylus vibrating, and that vibrates the cartridge, which in turn can vibrate the tone arm. And if you were to get a little uh, little cone, you know, a little paper cone, and like somehow tape it onto the top of this cartridge and turn down the audio and play a record, of course you'd hear the sound coming out of that little cone. That's the, the original premise behind this all, is that, you know, Thomas Edison had this big horn that, you know, he used to amplify the sound that was vibrating due to the stylus in the grooves. But that stylus that he was using, that whole system created a hundred times more vibration than this does. If you play a record and you turn down your stereo, you can barely hear it coming off the record. There's very little vibration there. But again, we're amplifying those little tiny vibrations thousands of times. So if there's any kind of interference at all going on here, we're also going to amplify that too. So I'm not belittling that. It's very important to, to remember that. But, you know... Those small vibrations, making it through the cartridge, making it through the tone arm. Suppose there's a specific frequency that the tone arm, you know, is comfortable with and it starts to resonate at that frequency. Just like when you strike a bell, it resonates, right? That's what a bell does. So, you know, you have a tone arm and you know, a certain frequency, a certain guitar note, and that tone arm goes, whoa, you know, I like that, right? And it, so it vibrates and it resonates. The theory is, is that resonance is going to make it back into the cartridge and that you're going to be able to hear it, which is possible because, you know, you strike a note on an instrument, that note resonance resonates, and then the resonance comes back to that note and adds to it, and now all of a sudden you've got what we call ringing or resonance. And it, theoretically, yes, it can happen, but I don't concern myself with that. I'm not going to go and spend... 30000 20000 10000 not even $5,000 or $1,000 on a tone arm for that reason. I'm not. Uh, even if I had the money, I just can't. I think it's just, I don't, I don't believe in it. That's just my opinion. Okay. Um, some tone arms are made out of different materials and they claim that that reduces the resonance. This is, and there's all this thing about tolerance and all this stuff. Um, there's a lot of mechanics going on here and I'm not an elect, I'm not a mechanical engineer. And I don't claim to be, but I do have a lot of experience with, with music. I'm a musician. I worked in recording studios for many years, and I have some experience with sound. Um, I just didn't, I just don't get overly, you know, um, I'm just a normal guy who likes music. I don't get overly fanatic. And I think that um, a lot of us who, and a lot of you who are watching this video, are in the same boat. I mean, it's fun to watch these crazy, expensive, you know, turntables and things and record cleaners that are worth thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's interesting, but to me, it, it, it's almost like, I'm afraid it's going to make some of you feel inadequate because we can't all afford those things. But let me tell you this, 
If you're spending $500,000 on a stereo system in, a, in an acoustic setup in your room, then you've got the money to spend that much money on a turntable. And you're probably not interested in this in me anyway, if that's the case, because you don't need me to tell you what to look for in a turntable if you've already spent that much money on the rest of your system. I'm talking to the normal average people who want to buy a turntable or who want to you know, enjoy this hobby or this way of listening to music and not think about, oh, you know, I wish I could, I want that $30,000 tone arm. It's just, you know, no, it's not, it's not necessary to think about those things. And there's a lot of people capitalizing on the resurgence of vinyl. And those, are, those people out there who have to have the best and they, they can't stand it if somebody's got something better. Um, and yes, granted, there are people out there who appreciate their music so much. And they've got the money to spend or they're getting it for free somehow. Sure, why not have this big expensive thing going on? I, I, hey, that's awesome. If someone, you know, who wouldn't want that? But the important thing is, is that, you know, everybody has to stay realistic here. Okay? There's a lot of mechanical things going on here. But if the turntable is decently manufactured, it's got smooth bearings, you know, you set it up properly, you get a good cartridge on it, you know, get some good wires on it too, because those are important. You know, you want a, some good cables at the back, not just the ones that come with it. And, you know, the rest of your system should be decent as well. And, of course, your speakers are almost as important, if not just as important as your turntable is. I think the bottom line is this hobby, or if it's called, if you want to consider it a hobby, um, it didn't used to be a hobby back in the 70s when I did this, you know, every day. It was a means of listening to music. I did tend to lean towards the fussy side of things back then and I still do you know I take care of my system I try to make sure it's hooked up properly and everything is acoustically as close as I can get it to 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 acceptable you know that's the best I can do that's the best anyone can do and I don't want anybody looking there down there and oh you you have one of those audio technicas you've got a you only paid three hundred dollars for it oh god I'm just, Oh, geez, you know, and they, they, meanwhile, they've got this $5,000 thing. It's just, it, the, I think that the people who have the money and the means to buy these expensive pieces of equipment have to have some consideration for those of us who don't. And if, if they need to spend, you know, $75,000 on a turntable in order to play one of these okay okay i didn't want to offend anybody in this video i don't want to you know uh, you know burst anyone's bubble there are people out there who will spend a lot of money on a belt or on a mat or on a you know a, a bearing or something okay uh i i would love to see somebody blindfolded and tell me the difference between one belt and another belt um, that would be very interesting for me. I would like to see that personally. That would be very entertaining because I don't think there would be a difference. That's just me. All right, guys. Um, thank you for listening to this rant and uh, happy listening. Don't forget, vinyl is final. Cheers. Be safe. Thank you.